The global right has called on the federal government to provide conducive rehabilitation programs for repentant terrorists and victims of terrorism in the northern region of the country. The program manager of the organization, Edosa Oviawe, made this known at a dialogue to discuss the gender and economic context of insecurity in the northern region of the country held in Abuja. Oviawe says the program, which had other key stakeholders in attendance, seeks to profile solutions to the challenges facing the communities torn apart by extremist violence. The the violence in, the, in northern Nigeria has over time uh, had this uh, coloration of, uh, of uh, religious extremism. Uh, but uh, Global Rights have been collating data on uh, atrocities across Nigeria. And our data show that uh, it's more complex than that in northern Nigeria, uh, beyond the, just the religious part of it. Uh, there is also the economic part of it. Uh, uh, unemployment and the level of poverty as we have it in northern Nigeria is actually driving many of our young people in the north uh, to joining violent groups uh, because they see that now as a means of, of, uh, of making income, earning a living, especially with the way uh, ransom kidnapping is uh, becoming like uh, a booming business in Nigeria right now. And so many of the young people who are out of jobs who have no form of uh, income are uh, just trooping in to join this violent group. And so these are all other dimensions, other drivers of, of violence as we have it in northern Nigeria. Uh, but uh, equally uh, to all of these, uh, there is equally uh, the, the gender dimension uh, of, to this whole issue of violence in the, in the northeast, in the north, northern region uh, in general. Uh, if you recall uh, recently some, some group of uh, the Chibo guests that were abducted some years ago were rescued uh, by the government uh, forces. And one thing that came out was that all of them came back with babies, uh, two or three, some two, some three, a number of children. Uh, these, are, these are children that they have given birth to as a result of forced marriage. They've been forced to marry their adopters. And these are the gender-based violence dimension of this uh, violence going on uh, in the north in the northern Nigeria presently. And so Global Right we've thought of okay, let's 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 have this conversation. Uh, let's bring critical stakeholders together, particularly in the run up to the elections coming up, uh, to see with, with this forthcoming election, how does this violence even affect the, the, the northern Nigeria? Uh, even the women and girls living there, what are the likelihood of, of their participation in these elections? How does this level of violence in the north affect, affect it? And so just to have that conversation and then to, of course to look at what can we do as, uh, as civil societies, what can we do as critical stakeholders in the Nigeria project to, to, to resolve these issues. And so that is why this, this uh, dialogue was put together. As we've called it, it's a conflict-specific dialogue for, for northern Nigeria to, to interrogate or to spotlight the insecurity and the level of violence uh, in northern Nigeria. Uh, the way the program is designed in itself is looking like it's tainted towards rehabilitating the, the, the insurgents, the, the male insurgents, the boys that have been part of the insurgency. But what about the victims, uh, the, the women and girls and other victims that have been kept in the camp of this of this uh, insurgents or these violent groups for some for months, some for years, and then when they come back the program is not, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the whole idea of that rehabilitation program didn't fully capture how to respond to this. They were majorly, it was majorly focused on, on the perpetrators of this violence that are laying their hands. So we need to revisit that rehabilitation uh, program to see that the, the victims who have stayed in the camp of these people, we have, it full, uh, we have a, a full response or approach on how to integrate them. Because as, as it was noted, many of these uh, girls that were victims that have spent time in the camp come back and then the first thing is everybody is looking like them like oh that uh, that that woman uh, that one is uh, is uh, is a terrorist wife or is, is, is this is that and then she gets just she just get frustrated and then she start finding her way back to to the camp trying trying to to look for that terrorist husband with which they have labeled her and so that is where the failure is our, our rehabilitation program have to be looked again to see how we we it encompasses everyone both the perpetrators that are laying their arms and of course those that have been victims that have been forcefully taken into those camps. Also. However, it is much more pronounced when we are talking about issues around sexual and gender-based violence, for example. Why did she go to his house? Why was she wearing this dress? Um, she tempted him. 
all those kind of little little narratives and when you now look at it in the area of insurgency um, and um, how the culture of silence has been perpetrated in Nigeria. You see it's a much more rooted problem where we decide we just decide not to speak about it in the whole issue around the insurgency happening happening in the northeast. Uh, we, sp we speak more around the uh, destruction of the communities, you know, livelihood, but we do not talk about uh, the women because we feel it's a shameful thing to talk about. You know, not talking about these women so is also like not recognizing them or even shaming them for what has happened to them. And you know, the example I gave in my degree, uh, it's, it's, it, everybody can check it out. People who, um, people who have been emancipated from their perpetrators and then they have to run back to them. G even looking beyond that, you see people um, in, I mean, in privileged societies, because of this shaming, people still return to their perpetrators. Somebody that beats them up every day, you know, um, uh, do this issue around sexual and gender-based violence, but because society does not accept that these people are victims and we should find a way for them to be internalized back to the society, we treat them badly, we, we blame them, we do a lot of blame game, they run back to those people because they have been wired to think about these things like love. And, you know, it's a big problem for society. We need to start looking at people who have gone through the issue of sexual and gender-based violence as victims and then try to create adequate solutions for them. There are a lot of solutions that we can look into. Community-based community solutions, we can look at therapy, we can look at, you know, providing economic emancipation for them. Uh, the holy books, whichever one you believe in, says the idle man is the devil's workshop. When you give people things to do, it takes at least it takes away their mind from those things as they are also healing up. But when they don't have anything to do, they are always in their rooms, you know, somebody coming and then talking to them anyhow. They, they you know, they feel that pain all over again. But if society is finding a way, you know, to, to create solutions for them, try to see them as, oh, you are a member of the society, then slowly but surely I'm sure we'll be able to erase the stigma. Well, traditional and customary rulers have a key role to play. Um, as custodians of culture, there are also people that can rally their communities when there's areas of conflict and also to resolve in those conflicts. Uh, one major thing they can do is to begin to encourage survivors of gender-based violence to speak up and also to provide services for them. Um, oftentimes, when this crisis, when survivors of violence um, speak to their family members. There's this tendency for them to want to shield this information from getting out because of fear of stigma and also shame that they feel that they cannot cope with the consequences of the trauma that their family member is, uh, is experiencing. But traditional rulers can give them that confidence by ensuring that they create a safe space for these stories to be heard by also calling on the perpetrators and getting the justice system to work. I think those few things can go a long way to improving community safety, but also confidence in survivors that they would get justice. Um, if you look at the number of deaths that we've recorded in the Northwest, the number of kidnapping, now you find out that banditry has grown and there are, there are other drivers of this. So probably you are asking me, what are the drivers of this violent conflict? This includes issues of, like we said, issues of poverty, the, the, way, we've, um, the way governance has been played or played out in this region for a, a long time now. You know, we found out that in this place, uh, religion, religion drives politics and in a way it has affected the way the state and the government has reacted to things. But I think the most important thing is for us to first understand that we can solve this. And for us to understand that we can solve this means that the leadership, and leadership now should not only be formal leadership, informal leadership as well, have to work together, both uh, government at all levels, as well as informal leadership like the church and the monks, the traditional authorities have to come out. I think um, the issue is that there is the issue of trust here. Government have to start rebuilding trust. People have to start trusting government to want to give want to work with government. The issue is that if we don't, if people don't trust that the government can protect and provide for them, they will start looking for alternative government. And most times, where, what, where are these alternative government? They lie with the non-state actors who are violent in nature. We need to find a way, at least for this election, we need to work with um, the non-state security provisioning teams. Here, I mean, 
the vigilante groups. I don't mean we should deploy them to serve as those that will provide security for the election, but we can use them to away to wage places where we think the military will not be occupying. So we need to do that as soon as we can. Because the issue, like for instance, if you take Anambra State or the CJTF in Boronu State, they are providing some form of security. Even though you're not going to deploy them to work um, for you on the election day, but you can use them to safeguard some of these communities. Why you can use the police and other state security actors to do the security, to election work.